This adventurous race of men who prowl on the weird floor of the ocean in quest of these sponges that are used to wash our automobiles and little Johnny's back on Saturday night. We're on the west coast of Florida, but in imagination these sponge fishing ships take us to distant times. Since dim antiquity, men have hunted for sponges on the floor of the sea, and for thousands of years the great sponge fisheries were in the eastern Mediterranean among the isles of Greece. Today, they are here in the Gulf of Mexico. For generations, one family has built all of the luggers. They're exact copies of the boats used from time immemorial by the sponge fishers of the Aegean Sea, except for their American motors. In Bible times, the peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean were beguiled by the adventurous life of the sponge divers. Today, the marvel of the sponge fisheries has been transferred to a quaint Florida colony of simple, hardy men, men of the sea, men of the undersea. A transplanted bit of the land where Homer twanged his bloomin' lyre, as Kipling said. Plus a touch of Dixie with its laughing darkies. The divers who prowl the undersea off Florida are all Greeks, some born here, others brought over. They are descendants of the sponge divers who in the days of the Greeks and Romans plunged naked with a heavy stone under one arm to take them down to the dim world of the sponges. Greek divers established this colony at Tarpon Springs, Florida, some 80 years ago. One section of the city is given over to them. They speak their own language, have their own church and their own government. They fly the flag of Greece and the American flag. Well, we're off for the sponge fishing grounds now. Five in the crew and supplies for a three-month cruise. Below deck is a smelly cargo of spaghetti, olive oil, tomato paste, a hundred pounds of garlic. Did you ever smell a hundred pounds of garlic? Oh, oh and 200 pounds of onions. That'll fix the sea breezes. We're in shoal water now among the Rock Island sponge bars, which extend from 100 to 200 miles off the coast, and below these turbulent waters is the realm of those fantastic living things we call sponges. He's heaving the lead. Down it goes to the bottom of the sea like a then he hauls it up again. The lead has soap on the end that picks up stuff from the ocean bed. If it's sand, not so good. Gravel means sponge. How does it look, boy? Gravel? Fine. The symbol of the sponge diver's trade is that diving helmet on the left. These lads are the master sponge diver's assistants. Here's our diver. He's a weather-beaten, sea-scarred, sponge-seasoned veteran. The diver's assistants are always the same men, each responsible for a certain part of the outfit. The diver's life is in their hands. They're starting the air compressor to inflate his suit. Suppose the air hose wasn't connected right. Suppose they left a bolt unfastened. But let's not do any supposing. Let's not think of anything like that because we're going down with him in just a moment. It seems to be a middle-aged or old man's game. Apparently, it's a dangerous profession and the youngsters down Florida way give it a wide berth. Perhaps brave youth hasn't the nerve. Anyway, they have to bring over the old-timers from Greece. And this chap has been at it long enough to own his own boat, property in Athens, and he's never seen Athens. His suit is inflated now. He can control the air pressure by simply pushing his head against an outlet valve. He gauges the pressure with his ears. If he feels that heavy oppression, like we feel when we go through a tunnel, he bobs his head against the air valve. And now he's ready for the sponge diver's great adventure. He's ready to jump. And jumping overboard is a difficult thing to do. Difficult, I mean, because if he has, to, has too much air in his suit, he'll turn upside down the second he hits the water. Then he can't right himself and is absolutely helpless and has to be hauled back on deck. He's letting air out of his helmet, hence the bubbles. Letting out the air permits him to sink, and as he goes down, two men on deck slowly uncoil his air hose and lifeline. Down, down he goes to the weird sights of the undersea. But distance is deceiving. These fish look close. They look small. In reality, they are from four to eight feet long and quite a way off. Down, down he goes. On his way, he passes a cliff, a bit of eerie mountain scenery in Neptune's world. And now he's gleaning the wealth of the ocean floor. Like an unearthly monster, he gropes his slow, grotesque way. He always walks against the current, like a man leaning into a heavy wind. If he tried to walk with the current, it would bowl him over and he wouldn't be able to get up. His outfit weighs 570 pounds. He wears ponderous cast-iron shoes. 
And so, maneuvering to get his balance, he drags one foot after another in slow, mysterious fashion. The cameraman, too, did a bit of undersea adventuring that day. With his specially built underwater camera, he descended to a depth of over 100 feet. The best commercial sponges come in deep water like this. Sometimes he finds a nest, sometimes they are scattered. And the most valuable found in Florida waters is the sheep's wool sponge. That's what he's hunting for, although he picks up other varieties too. And when he has a full net, he pulls down a length of his lifeline. He attaches his sponges, signals to the surface, and the lads on the lugger pull them up. It's a fair haul. <laughs> While he gropes and fishes with what looks like Neptune's trident, the life of the sea teems around him. There are dangers from sharks and the vicious barracuda, the tigerfish, and the only way he can fight them is by releasing a blast of air from his helmet. The hissing noise, the glistening bubbles like brilliant gems frighten off the barracuda. The light is brilliant around the sponges on the sea floor but everything disappears within a short range of vision. Worst of all his dangers are the giant turtles of the Gulf of Mexico. They'll bite off a man's arm or leg, and woe betide him if he happens to stumble upon a turtle's rendezvous. There is no way to fight the 2,500-pound armored monsters, for the diver is only capable of a slow, languid motion in this fantastic realm of Mr. Sponge. But wait a minute, we shouldn't say Mr. Sponge. We should say both Mr. and Mrs. because old man Sponge is both male and female in the same individual, which makes him old lady Sponge too. Inhabitants of the clear green world swim by and everything moves with a slow, graceful, undulating movement. The diver has been on the bottom for over an hour. Once more, he has a full net. His day's work is over and he signals on the lifeline I'm through, boys. Pull me up. And in a boil of bubbles, he pops to the surface. But his danger is not over. It is when he is floating helplessly, bobbing on the surface like this, that he is in the greatest danger of being attacked by the ferocious barracuda. The lads on board wind up his air hose and his lifeline and tow him in. Then when they have him towed alongside, he climbs up the ladder. And he hands up his last net of sponges. But he doesn't hurry. In fact, all the way up from the bottom of the sea, he takes his time. He must do this. He must come slowly in order to gradually adjust the air pressure. And then, for the same reason, he must be careful about taking off his helmet. If he doesn't, well, he'll suffer from a strange illness that is the dread of all men of the undersea. It is an illness called the bends. It cripples them, bends them over, so they become prematurely old. Then on board begins the process of preparing the sponges, squeezing and scraping away the living fluid, because the sponge is an animal. What we call the sponge is only the skeleton. Around it, in it, is the living substance which has to be removed. Homeward bound with our cargo of sponges after a three months cruise in the Gulf of Mexico. All is excitement when the boats come in, but it isn't payday for the boys. The men of the sponge fleet have been all paid in advance, the pay being based on the estimated size of the catch before they go out. Sometimes an owner is disappointed because the catch doesn't equal the advance pay of the men, and then he roars with an eloquence that would make Demosthenes sound like a peanut whistle. Through the gates in the yard of the sponge exchange where the auctions take place are $90,000 worth of sponges drying. The sponge fishers, being Greeks, are not exactly unsophisticated. It's a case of Greek meeting Greek battling for a million dollars, the value of the annual catch at the world's biggest sponge market. All the world clamors for sponges. They pound them to break small shellfish that sneak inside and make themselves at home in Mr. Sponge's labyrinthine innards. All day long they pound and clip, trimming off the rough edges where the sponge clung to the rock. Some of the boys are making little sponges out of big ones. I went to the movies last night. I don't know why. I was doing pictures last night. And this is the object and the goal of the adventurous quest on the perilous floor of the sea. 
and we return once more to that quaint cafe where again we hear the old traditional chanting from far off Greece, the song of the sponge divers. <laughs> 